Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 643, the best of Science Faction 2022! It's actually just replaying the best moments from Science Faction 2021. Uh, we yes, but I replay. I technically published that episode in 2022, the best of episode. It was published in January of 2022. Therefore, it in, it counts as the best of 2022. Bam! This you see. This is what it's like, audience. This is what I call BS. Is like he bends the rules and manipulates you, and 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 he's like the devil. Like to the to the contract, he's not wrong, but you're cheated. I'm just out there burying fossils and making young men feel attracted to other young men. It's the greatest trick you ever played, and it was awesome. I, I... That was not the greatest trick. The greatest one was when I pretended to lose to that fiddle or at the, the, the down in Georgia. <laughs> he was he was an overweight Southern man. I, uh, he was really racist. He made the world the worst place. What am I going to do? Kill him? Like, that come on. fiddler <laughs> was Herschel Walker. <laughs> uh, is it true, uh, Senate c- candidate Walker, that you claim to have beaten the devil in a fiddle off? <laughs> Are you sure you're not <laughs> like um, the fourth hardest lie to prove? Like the, the, that he said. Like it would have been <laughs> abortions are the worst. <laughs> I never met that. Per- like there are so many great. Just like I. How do you think you're getting away with this one lies? But uh, yeah, anyway, regardless, we're not, we're talking about the best science of 2022. For those of you guys who listened to last week's episode, you heard some of our favorite funny bits and stuff. In this episode, I want to focus on the actual science stories themselves, the best science stories of 2022, the ones I thought were the best. And I will tell you at the end of every year, uh, I keep an li- ongoing list kind of of things I think are interesting throughout the year. At the end of every year, I go back and I look at other people's lists. I go to Scientific American. I go to all the other websites, see what their best science stories of 2022 is. And in, in almost invariably, I am matching to about, you know, out of my top 10 stories, at least seven of them match somebody else's. Um, and even there might not be the same, you know, list or whatever, but you know, it's very rare that more than three of my things of most biggest science stories of the year are not on at least one other group's list. I gotta say, Damien, I don't know what the fuck happened this year, but my list is so far off from everybody else's list that I think there's like, of all the lists I look at, there was like one or two of their top 10 that coincided with one or two of my top 10. So like something is up this year where I personally think it is that I think the biggest stories, science news stories of 2022, were not things that make big big headlines. And so regular journalists like weren't aware of them, whereas we look at obscure science articles every week. So I pick those out during the during the year and be like, oh, fuck, this is a huge deal. Look at this later. And as I will say sometimes during the week when I'm reporting this, this is not a popular news story for some reason, but it's a really big deal. Listen, uh, fans, we're the outlier. For better or for worse, gamble on science yeah. faction. We're either the outlier giving you worthless science information or we're the ones giving you the, the, we're the, we're the Alex Jones info wars giving you the hot truth, giving you the truth that the media is too afraid. Damien, to I want to see, you know, I've, I've looked at my comparison of my thoughts versus the thoughts of other, you know, science journalists and stuff. I kind of want to see what you think might be on my list. If you had to pick like the biggest, and it doesn't have to be biggest, like the most popular, the most important science discoveries of 2022 that we have covered, what would you put in there? Well, I know we closed the year really strong with the entirely new branch yep. of life and uh, also uh, fusion yep. energy. I know those are two two, two big ones. Uh, there was the James Webb Space sure. Telescope. Alex Jones appeared to bend the laws of physics to appear on this show many times, and nobody reported on that. They they were focused on his finances when I think like the bigger science story was under the hood. You know, you just had to look a little sure. deeper. You had to just dig a little. Um, outside of that. Okay, David. Well, I got to say, even you and I aren't necessarily simpatico on this because I think there was only one of those that actually made my list. Alex Jones. Uh, yeah, exactly. What other what other nerd shit were you talking about? Uh, but no, no, I mean, <laughs> so I'm going to go off and say I saw James Webb on a bunch of other people's lists. I know you mentioned James Webb. I think James Webb is going to be a gigantic thing that helps us explain the universe in ways we never thought possible before. But it was launched in 2021. We got some great images back in 2022, but 
in terms of really groundbreaking science, we're certainly getting data and some of that is very important. I don't know that we have yet crossed the threshold, in my opinion, of like really new information that we're getting that's, that's blowing us away. There's absolutely new stuff. Don't get me wrong. We have gotten new information from there. It's just that the accomplishment of putting it up was a 2021 accomplishment. And I don't believe we have gotten to the point yet of finding the data that will, I believe, make James Webb an even bigger deal later. That is the reason why it is not on my top 10 list. Yeah, wait till we score alien nudes. Then James Webb is will be on Bobby's list. Like uh, like the, uh, the Breastopians have sent an ambassador. You know, I think Damien's comment about the, you know, the biological tree of life is a good one because that finding, there were two big bio stories. One was finding a species of archaea that was likely the, the branching point to eukaryotes because of the scaffolding they had. And that was like on our last episode of the year or something. And the other one was one in which we, we talked about how we found a whole new branch of life that occupied this huge portion that we didn't know existed before. Uh, and that was really, really interesting as well. Neither of those did make it on my list. I think I think Damien, you're fair to bring those up. I think one at least one of those, probably the, the latter, is one of us is wrong. I agree with that. Uh, but it did not it did not happen to to be on my my top ten list. So let me go through. So uh, we're not going to actually listen to the clips here. Feel free to go ahead and do that. We'll talk a little bit about the stories and and what you remember about them. Damien, this is the oldest one. This is number ten on my list. Do you remember this all the way back in January episode five ninety six when we talked about the mean stats? And the story here was really interesting. It's somewhat of a convoluted mathematical one, but it's a very, very interesting story when you really get into it, especially if you can understand it. And the idea is that when we look at changing something, if we go, hey, we want to change the grades of these kids, you know, we, we have this normal distribution. We want to raise all the grades of these kids. We want to raise, you know, the pay, average pay of an average person or something. What we usually talk about is moving the average. So if, you know, the average is 20 right now, we want to get that average up to, to 25 or something right that, like that. Well, in really deep statistical analysis, a paper came out that showed that moving the average isn't actually what's best for everybody, right? All you're doing is focusing on what's going on in the middle and seeing if you can shift the middle over five points as opposed to actually shifting the whole data set, set over five points in a lot of statistical interventions that we do. And that looking at the mean as a gauge of progress is oftentimes like, a huge mistake because all you're measuring is the average change, which could be, you know, the average change of the main big group of people in the middle. It could be a change of the tail on the far outlier that brought the average over. And you have to look at, you know, mean, median, mode, z-score. You have to have like a full statistical comprehensive look at something before you can be sure that your intervention is accurate. And so often, both in formal papers and in especially in like science reporting, all we're talking about is averages, means. And, and moving that mean over might not mean, quote unquote, what we think it means. So you want to you want to raise the base, is that it? Or you want to to you want to raise everybody, and you see that if you look at z scores, if you look at you know if you look at your standard deviations, if you look at those things, you can see that the entire group has shifted to the right as opposed to you know the people that make up the actual average have shifted just those you know ten people over five points, and that will shift your entire average. I was I was thinking about this in terms of education. You know, does that mean just focusing on the uh, Focusing on the on the on the bottom five percent. No, harder. no, it means focus on everybody. That's the whole point. Is that a lot of times these interventions appear as if they're hitting everybody, and they're only hitting those people who are right in the middle. If you want to look at hitting everybody, you're gonna to have to look past the mean. It's not gonna tell you that by itself. Now, it is a good indicator. It's not like it means nothing. It's not like it's not also a good indicator of everybody also moving. But what they showed it through statistical analysis is that oftentimes what we th think we're doing and in making improvements is not actually making improvements to the broad population, only to a very narrow band of it. So you need kind of just a little bit more statistical literal literacy and more statistical information to determine whether or not you are actually making a difference for the whole group. That's how you reach those kids. Yes. By speaking broadly to everyone. That and drugs. Like if you were the teacher who brought <laughs> drugs to school... <laughs> You say what you want. These these kids on co these kids are motivated to co nobody's ditching now that I'm given cocaine. That's right. Nobody's ditching. All right, my ninth, my suggestion for number nine of important science news articles of the year. This was a double important one. This was really interesting. This goes all the way back to six eleven. 
And we talked about the first ever genetically grown pig heart that was emplaced into a human and how amazing that was and how it had we had to, you know, do a lot of stuff to make that that viable and all that stuff. But then that guy later died. He's the only person in history to die of a pig only disease. And it was because the was murdered by police (laughs) when Hogman uh, attacked a bank. I'm I'm trying to think of like a Spider-Man villain because this is clearly a superhero or villain origin story. I mean, he got a disease from his pig heart, like his heart. We thought we had scanned it for the disease, but it turns out it was probably latently hanging out in there. And then it went in his body. The pig immune system wasn't there to keep the disease in check anymore. With a human immune system that can't really do anything in his pig heart, the disease went crazy and ended up killing him. He's the only person who has ever died from this particular disease because it can't infect humans. It can only infect pigs, comma, asterisks, also humans with pig hearts, I guess. Uh, but I that was just one of those interesting, like, what an amazing medical breakthrough slash what a tragic medical story all in the same time. It, uh, it, it uh, shows Bebop, you know, in a hospital bed dying slowly. <laughs> they didn't tell you about this in the transformation, did they? <laughs> it's a very sad uh, Ninja Turtles episode where everybody puts aside their differences and um, mourns Bebop. Uh, dear, article number eight. All right, let's go out to, to my eighth biggest science news article of the year. This one I like just because, A, people were talking about it, but B, it's so counterintuitive. Damien, do you even, do you remember this? Episode 607, we talked about how earthworms are actually invasive to North America and actually do some damage to the dirt and can cause issues with certain plants. Yes, uh, that episode, my sister was talking about her earthworm garden and everything, yes. and I wanted to like bring up that like, no, those little shits are uh, are an invasive terrorist species. <laughs> they are, they are, but that doesn't mean, but you got to remember, most of our plants are invasive species too, and they work symbiotically with, you know, better earthworms and stuff. It's really like the native species that get fucked over. It's like if you're gardening or stuff, you want a bunch of earthworms. You, you're growing old world crops usually. You, you want that. You want good soil and stuff. What's really damaging is that it seems to to cause problems for native plants and native insect species that uh, operate close to the ground. Ha- everything to do with you know losing topsoil because you know it doesn't doesn't adhere to it as well to, you know, to over oxygenating the soil and those worms. I think they eat some of the native plant bulbs that aren't used to having earthworms around them and stuff. So like it's really more of an issue where it's damaging to native species, but good if you're you know try to have a green thumb in in your pepper garden. Pepper garden? That's what you grow? Yes. Pepper? Bell peppers. Oh, I mean, like, oh, 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 I see, I see. I thought you were, uh, you were, uh, you like, you're like a Dwight Schrute character making your own pepper spray because you don't <laughs> trust big pepper spray. <laughs> uh, dear, how about uh, Damien all the way back in episode 637? This was one that I'm still, still thinking about on the regular because I'm wondering if it's going to end up being a cure. Do you remember when we found out that it turns out leprosy can help you regrow your liver? Yes. Uh, Yes, I remember that. Uh, I I actually told that to to people. And then then it got into a whole other leprosy uh, thing. Like people, because like, if it wasn't for this show, I would still not know a thing about leprosy. and just think it was like a, 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 like a, a still a threat out there. I'm a science nerd. And if it wasn't for this show, I would have thought leprosy endemically comes from armadillos as opposed to some conquistador fucking one in the 1500s and creating an endemic infection within armadillos that continues to this day. No, see, so yeah, because because I knew that there was that armadillos. I'm pretty sure don't exist in Europe. Right? Prove me wrong, Bobby. No, no, they don't. Uh, b- b- but uh, uh, I, but I knew like from Braveheart, which I saw at a young age yeah. with my father, that leprosy affected old world Europeans. Yeah. So I knew I didn't know if it was just a disease you got from like like uh like it was a genetic disease. Right. If uh if if God cursed you or you just got it from like living in uh in water infected with your own shit. Oh, you didn't know it was a bacterial did infection. I didn't know. Okay. I, I was like, I thought it was a cancer maybe. I'd... Now, what did you, what was the discussion you got into with other people about lep? Was it an armadillo sex discussion? Yes. Cause it, cause it, it goes back. Yes. I was like, I was like the only place you can get it in dem- get it now is basically from armadillos. Yeah. And, uh, and then I also brought up the fact that like, Oh, armadillos, it's not a something native to them. It's something that, uh, the conquistadors gave them. So like yeah. some, they brought like William Wallace's or, uh, uh, Sir, Sir Robert, the Bruce's dad from Braveheart. Um, <laughs> Uh, to to the new world for some reason, and then they tried radical armadillo therapy. Yeah, you just cut I guess with on them. Him. Oh, like just just <laughs> buried his body in armadillos. <laughs> 
The priests are baffled why this armadillo therapy isn't working. Oh, well, let's release these armadillos into the wild. <laughs> oh, dear. So, uh, yeah, so I guess you're, you're, you're lamenting having, sounding like an insane person trying to discuss the history of leprosy in the new world. Yeah. Well, I mean, where they were, where all these people, even like older people, they still thought it was like, oh, the, the Hawaiian Island's not there anymore. It's like, no, it's a bacteria, it's just antibiotics. Yeah. Antibiotics fixed. That's why you don't hear about it anymore. Yeah. Like that simple fact. I, I mean, everybody buys that. As soon as I say that, it's like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. But like, I don't know. Le- leprosy is like such an ancient disease. We just don't. And I, by the nobody way. Nobody knows shit about it. I do think there are still like, I think there are still leprosy infections going on in places like India and stuff where there are people who have it. And, and it's just an issue of like lack of access to antibiotics. Uh, can you do the phage treatment on I, leprosy? I don't know if we have a phage that targets that bacterium. No, but we could create one, right? Like in a lab. No, right? I don't know. We've just, never just done dump, that, dump, so I don't know. We we nor, all we do is take existing phages that are naturally around. I'm just I'm just talking theoretically. If we took a bucket of phages and just dumped it on a bunch of uh, leprosy, some of it would adapt, right? Like uh, some of it would. No, but let's say yes for for your purposes. What then? Okay, well then you've you've created the phage. Then you then you modify that. You 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 have your weapon. Then you weaponize them. You you make them into the velociraptors that you need. The James Cameron's aliens. I look how in your mind, there's just like two sickly armadillos wandering around like a enclosed pit. And then like a guy in a lab coat shows up with a wooden barrel, use a crowbar, prize it off the top. And it says phages. And he just like dumps it over these infested armadillos. He's like, that ought to do it. Science. That, isn't that pretty much like how like like no! how it happens in real life? No, it's like a not. certain percentage, a certain percentage of these. Like if I dumped a bunch, like if if, if I if I drank enough monkey blood, eventually like uh, one of those diseases would maybe not drink, but if I'm exposed skin to skin to enough uh, to enough monkeys, eventually one of these uh, microbes will adapt to to sure. be able to 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 its environment. I thought that's just how natural selection works. And when you're working in phages, which are so numerous, if you ha- literally had a bucket of them, it would be like into the quadrillions. Yeah. So you could. So I just thought, like, hey, well, one of them, one of them will kill. One of them will uh, will do its thing. Uh, dear. That's how it works. I don't care. I'm I'm, I'm done. That's how it works. <laughs> my uh, my suggestion for the number sixth most important science discovery of the year, uh, all the way back in episode six thirty one, the kind of discovery that essentially colonoscopies are useless. Now the caveat to this is they're useless in light of having access to sigmoidoscopies, which is basically like half a colonoscopy and you don't keep going for the rest of the half. And it's something like 98% of all cancers that are found are found in a sigmoidoscopy. I think 100% of all cancers that are that have been treatable have been found within a sigmoidoscopy, meaning the rest of the process of a colonoscopy past the sigmoidoscopy statistically has saved zero lives. And is the reason we have to put you under anesthesia. It is the reason that recovery is. It's like it turns what is a minor procedure into a non-minor procedure. I don't want to call it a major one, but a non-minor thing. And, and it is useless. Essentially, we have found that the rest of that thing is useless. Now, there are some very specific exceptions, right? If you have known colon cancer, you have to go up and find those things. That makes sense. What we're talking about is, for survey purposes, exploratory colonoscopies, just looking for cancer, not not part of your surgery that is planned or something like that. It seems like these are totally useless. And by the way, the fear of them keeps men and women, by the way, because they get them too, from getting a effective sigmoidoscopy, which would be just as effective at finding and stopping lethal cancers as a colonoscopy without having to go all the way under, without having all of the issues, without having it being a big, huge, major deal. We've been scaring people away from what is actually effective by doing too much that is not effective. In that article, uh, if you go back and listen to that episode, fans, I actually have a joke that uh, b- made Bobby laugh. It was a it was a science butt joke. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> I-, I won't ruin it. But Bobby then went on to uh, quote unquote compliment me by saying, uh, "Damien's a college dropout. I uh, had to join the army, and <laughs> this is what this show has done with him. It has turned him from that guy into the guy who made the smartest science joke." And I want to let you know, Bobby, that Mark Zuckerberg also <laughs> dropped out of college. I am in fine company, sir. Although I did admittedly go back and then violate my Zuck, my Zuckness. Yes. But, <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that joke, and I do remember how funny it is. Or maybe I don't remember how funny it is. You sack of shit! <laughs> I'll let you think about that. <laughs> That's it. No more quantum comedy. We're done. Uh, uh, that was That was absolutely awesome. Super, super interesting, because... 
Like that's one of those where it's like, you know, we have a an actual fix like a sigmoidoscopy and we're we're scaring people away from that by going too far with it. All right, the fifth one, the number 5 that I chose as the most important science discovery of 2022, this was the association of the herpes virus with Alzheimer's. And actually, uh, more accurately, in elderly people, how shingles could reignite the latent herpes virus, the shingles zoster virus, could re- reignite the, the herpes virus. And the combination of that seems to have some role in creating uh, the plaques that we see in Alzheimer's disease. This particular experiment, if you remember, was done in like brain models, meaning like using brain cells, creating like little fake brain tissue in a dish and then like seeing it get infected or not infected. And we saw some of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's there. So it wasn't like, you know, this was a study on humans. So there is that caveat to it. But really interesting with the disease that I think last I checked, it was like 86% of Americans have and, you know, something that stays with you your whole life. And like, also, if we can figure out that, then maybe it is that we can, maybe we can also figure out Alzheimer's. I mean, this is huge. As we discussed before, fifth or sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. is Alzheimer's. It's a horrible disease that that kills more than the individual. It kills, you know, their human and personhood to some extent beforehand. And we have to watch that happen as, as their relatives. Just a, it's an awful disease. And it might be from something that's incredibly co- so common as to be ubiquitous within our population. And maybe if we could figure out how to control that, we can control the future of Alzheimer's, too. Yeah, uh, as, as somebody who has uh, who gets his mouth herpes every once in a while, yeah. I uh, become a freak, and I when I go outside, everybody stares at my lip. And somebody who uh, recently lost a grandfather with Alzheimer's, I am against both of these two things. I was yes. I was on the fence for a long time on yes. both of these issues. Before I was like, maybe I'm kind of team Alzheimer's, you know, like oh, I could watch all my favorite movies again. I wouldn't remember <laughs> them. You could watch Game of Thrones again from the beginning and be surprised. You're like, "Oh my god, have you guys heard about this red wedding?" You have to understand, I'm a centrist. And uh, <laughs> watch Game of Thrones? Oh man, I haven't seen the finale. I hope the last season's good. And I just am constantly disappointed about over and over and over again. No. Yeah, you know, I was I was on the fence for a long time. Uh, I'm I'm a centrist. You know, I I think both sides are crazy. You know, Team Alzheimer's, the the Alzheimer's yes. extremists and the anti Alzheimer's extremists are both crazy. I don't know who to root for. That's true. I mean, if we didn't have <laughs> if we didn't have Alzheimer's, this is what I like to I like to bring this up to the anti Alzheimer's extremists. If we didn't have Alzheimer's. Uh, we would have a lot of old people who would not be justly swindled out of their money, right? Like, so it is only (laughs) (laughs) due to Alzheimer's that many of our generation is able to buy homes, right? Like, that is how we have been able to get the down payment we need. To swindle, like, grandma. Not even your grandma. Doesn't have, in no, fact, it should be grandma. your grandma. That'll destroy yeah. a family. It should, That's you, wrong. And pray on somebody else's grandmother, please. Yeah, like, like that movie, Grandma's on a Train with Alzheimer's. <laughs> it's where you swindle someone else's grandmother out of their life savings. If Alzheimer's didn't exist, uh, grandmothers would be judgmental for a lot. The par- the paradigm power shift would take right. longer to shift. And then, like, uh, there would be a lot more grandmothers disapproving of interracial marriages. I feel like that'd be a Real, that'd be a real downside. Then uh, my fourth biggest science news article of 2022, all the way back in 620, figuring out that, and this is still a huge one. By the way, this is one I think about probably almost daily. Finding out that it isn't necessarily a lack of serotonin that is causing depression in most people. That was a huge discovery. It was a really big deal. I also, I want to remind people and caveat it. We did this at the time, but I want to re-caveat this. Do not stop taking your antidepressants. That is not what that means because frankly, even if, you know, a lack of serotonin isn't the problem that causes depression, that doesn't mean that SSRIs or something else might not also help that depression, right? So just because you're not low on serotonin doesn't mean that SSRIs might not help you get over depression. And also, for some people, it is low serotonin. For those people, SSRIs are necessary. But what this was was a huge, massive study that compared blood samples of people who with depression to those without, and they saw no difference in serotonin levels over the average. Again, There will be some in the extremes. Your brain can't produce enough serotonin. That will absolutely lead to depression. It's just that that is not the cause of the vast, overwhelming majority of depression. Now, that might be why SSRIs are not effective for everybody. But again, I want to caution you, even if you are one of the people for whom serotonin is not the issue, it doesn't mean that having more serotonin does not then help you. 
right? Just because the cause is something else doesn't mean that this won't help. But conceptually wise, in understanding what depression is, I think this is probably the biggest step we've taken in 30 years. I mean, figuring this out is such a huge deal and it might very well be one of the huge, I mean, it has to be one of the huge keys to being able to treat depression because you have to know what's wrong with somebody to be able to treat them. And, and realizing that these might be more psychological mechanisms than physiological ones are a really, really important step. A, a little bit of a tangent. Uh, isn't it true that one of the only, like, I guess, really effective treatments for depression is electroshock? No, no, there are many. I know, very it's, I know it is treatments. an effective. It is an effective treatment. Yes, but. yes, there there are many effective treatments for some people for whom very severe depression d is otherwise untreatable. For some of those people, they have found electroshock therapy helpful. Yes. And it's done, by the way, in modern times, it's done humanely. You're sedated during it. You're not feeling the shocks. Well, I'm, I'm saying, Bobby, is that we should create a YouTube channel and maybe next time I'm feeling a little down, we do like a jackass style, like you just tase the shit out of me. Done. And, and done. We, we could brand it as science. Hey, you know what? When we were younger, uh, we tased the shit out of each other. And I, I mean, I, I would say no one, there wasn't a time that more than two weeks passed without somebody getting tased, right? Like maybe it yeah, wasn't a daily <laughs> tasing, but like it was pretty routine. And I got to say, we were pretty young and carefree back then, Damien. You know, I don't want to be a causation correlation thing here, but maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what your life is missing. It's just like a good regular tasing. Yeah. I, I, I will say like, like when you get a little electricity going through, you're, you're awake. You're, yeah, you ain't, you're you're up. You're alert. <laughs> As was proven by the time that we I, we were once sleeping in the room with four different people, I woke you up because I, I kind of like got your attention. You woke up, and I awoke our other friend using a taser. So he was dead asleep. I tased him in the ass until he was awake, and it was the quickest wake up a human being has ever done. If you're gonna feel empathy for that man, don't. He is a climate change science denier. Yeah, well, and uh, I mean, I would start with sociopath and then move on to the climate change stuff, but fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> on to what I thought was the third uh, most important science news article of 2022. That would be all the way back in January in episode 597, what causes multiple sclerosis? And this was incredibly interesting. This was a huge study. It looked at military personnel. I think the end number was in the many millions, maybe like 5 million. And it found that whether or not it's absolutely the direct cause, Epstein-Barr infection, the, the infection with the Epstein-Barr virus is like 35, increases your chance of getting MS like 35 times as much or something. We basically now think at least if this article is right and everything is confirmed, that multiple sclerosis is a reaction that some people have to the Epstein-Barr virus, which is fucking terrifying because of how common it is. Kind of crazy because of, A, how common it is, but also somewhat good because it's now we have a target to go for, right? Now we have something we can look at and, and hopefully stop. And we think, you know, somewhere in there in that Epstein-Barr infection, your body's immune system confuses the myelin sheath on your optic nerves or on the other nerves around your body uh, for that infectious agent and begins attacking it. And so however we do it, figuring out that Epstein-Barr is the cause of that, to me, it's one of the biggest science news articles I've ever reported, but certainly, especially with the importance of MS and everything and the common frequency of Epstein-Barr, uh, certainly one of the most important science news articles of 2022. I don't remember this one, but uh, yeah, Epstein Barr virus. I, I've heard it a lot. What's is it like the cold? Like, how would I know if I like I, would I call in sick or is it asymptomatic? It's one of these things that if you get it when you're a little kid, which most little kids do, like before ten, nothing happens, right? You're totally fine. If you get it after ten, it becomes mono. You get mononucleosis. Okay. okay. It, not, not not everybody, like 60 or 70% or something, but like so it's normally a pretty harmless infection. But if you get it when you're older, it causes issues. And this was the case with the MS diagnosis. It was people who got that Epstein-Barr infection later in life, not as children. So it wasn't just a transitory thing that went through their system and then never bothered them again, i.e. chickenpox. It was something serious that happened. Yeah, mono. Everybody has a college story of the kid who caught mono. I know a guy who was out for football season. Uh, I actually, because uh, they thought I had mono in basic training, I got like a three week vacation in the middle of basic training. So there's a good side to mono too. There's a good side to mono too. I came back looking fit. It was it was great. I I I banged. I banged. <laughs> it was cool. Thanks, mono. I didn't actually have it. Just the threat of mono. <laughs> 
Uh, on to my number two science discovery of 2022. This one really struck home with me. Uh, I thought this was a really important thing. This is one of the few ones that did make a lot of like regular news sites. It didn't make their top stories of 2022. I don't know how. To me, this is one of the biggest stories of the last decade. This is, is it's such a big deal. All the way back to 621, where we were talking about science badasses, specifically the guy who went, who basically single-handedly discovered one of the biggest science frauds in history, having to do with Alzheimer's research, including, as he went back and did research, Alzheimer's research he had worked on as an undergrad. He found out his graduate you know, professor was faking and he found out all like the most seminal paper in Alzheimer's history, this 2006 paper that seems to indicate that the, the plaques that we're talking about are the cause of Alzheimer's, which is one of the major theories of Alzheimer's disease. He found out that particular paper was faked with these Western ink block tests that were faked and he became an expert in telling the differences and stuff. This was huge news because it meant that for 16 years we were going in the wrong fucking direction. It meant that people had committed major scale fraud in order to secure this funding. It meant that millions, if not billions of dollars in research funding into one of the worst diseases that is known to humankind has been misappropriated and going in the wrong direction for a decade and a half. It's to me, it's like one of the, it's fucking Watergate for science, you know? Yeah. He found out his master was the Sith. Yes. I mean, this is, this is huge. Yeah, he did the right thing. He didn't join him like some fucking bitchy little Anakin. No, he went off and he said, no, he was Ahsoka. He said, fuck no, I am not going onto the dark side with you. Yeah, by the way, I, I know a lot of kids. Uh, my brother and his wife are big, like, dark side uh, Darth Vader fans. I'm like, no, he's the, fuck, he is not the one to idolize. He's an little emo whiny bitch, played appropriately by Hayden Christensen, who we all criticized at the time, but was the only one brave enough to call out Darth Vader for what he was. Uh, I mean, the, if you think about it, the little kid played him the best <laughs> in, in terms of like the dark turn at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I thought that was a huge science news story. I think that should be, I, I can't believe that's not on every single science news list of the biggest stories of 2022. Because that that rocked my world personally. Uh, that, that you know, kind of shakes a lot of the foundations of faith that I have in, in main scale science and appropriation of funding and, and all of that stuff. And like, I understand this stuff happens and it has to come out. And, you know, we have talked about the replication crisis and all that stuff. I, I just think this should have been way bigger science news. I, I could see why. In fact, I wouldn't want this because this is this the, the Joe Rogans of the world would have a field day. Like, see, you can't trust science. It's a false religion. But it would be a false religion if we didn't talk about this. That's the whole point, right? If we brushed it off and didn't talk about it, then that's exactly what they do. That's cult behavior, right? Instead, we got to be the ones who headline it. We got to be the ones who go out and say, look, 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 everybody, look, we fucked up. I, I guess just here's the thing is that these, uh, I think there would be, you would be doing the right thing, but it would not be interpreted that way by the wrong people. And and I think like the, the wrong people have the bigger soapbox. And so like, while you would be doing the right thing, I think it would it would might hurt public trust in science. This is my theory in the long term, and uh, because we, you and I personally know people who would cite this in an argument to why science can't be trusted, and they would believe it to their core. But then I would cite it back as the exact reason science should be because it's self correcting. Uh, uh, okay, let, let me put this way: I've tried that, and he still uses, and you and you know the guy too, Bobby. He still <laughs> uses the the tobacco company argument. He has used it on both of us. He has been like, "Oh yeah, well the tobacco company was saying that cigarettes were good. That was science." Oh, uh, dude, that's that's actually a spot on impression. Uh, all right, and <laughs> lastly, what I what I thought was the biggest science news story and biggest science development of 2022. Damien hit the nail on the head. He knows me well. It is absolutely 6:39 Fusion Day. Rah, rah, rah. Just use the sound effect. It's free. It takes 30 seconds. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> sound effect. <laughs> You piece of shit. Our fans are worth it. Side effect, side effect, side effect. Side effect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm surprised you haven't like downloaded like a fart sound effect or, or like something spiteful. Like if there was a spiteful noise for me. 
sound effect. That's <laughs> just a Russian accent for everything I do. I don't know. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. That is when we, in the Lawrence Livermore lab, of course it would happen at Berkeley. That's at where they find, that Lawrence Livermore lab is Berkeley, by the way. Uh, that's where they announced that they had indeed had a fu- contained fusion reaction that gave off more energy than it took in. That is the day. That is the thing. That is what we've been waiting for for 50 plus years. Obviously, we are a while away from that becoming commercially viable, but this is it, man. We did it. We proved that fusion power is real. It is at a theoretically, or I mean, practically, I guess you would say, unlimited source of energy that we are going to have access to quite soon. And once that happens, our entire world changes. Our climate change issues change, not only because of our current exporting of greenhouse gases, but our ability to sequester greenhouse gas if we have what is practically unlimited energy. Our fights over resources. If you break it down to it, most resources are energy in the end. All of that stuff changes. Our world changes with fusion power generation. And yes, we are not there in terms of commercial things yet, but we are there in terms of we have done it. We have produced fusion energy. And every time we do something, it's just a short amount of time until we can commercialize that and make that a reality. But the the fact of the matter is our world will be different because of this discovery. Because of what we covered on 639, because of what was released on that day, our children's lives will be different than our own, and the world as we know it, whether it's in 20 or 50 years, will be vastly different because of the stuff that was going on 500 miles north of here in one tiny little lab someplace. It will absolutely change the nature of human life on Earth. But it won't change behaviors enough just to download an air horn sound effect or even just use a live one. You could just use a live cut from YouTube. Sound I'll, effect! I'll show you how. Sound effect! <laughs> you piece of shit. Sound, sound, sound effect, sound effect, sound effect. Meh, 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 meh. Oh, dear. Anyway, thank you, audience, for coming back to Science Faction 643, where you learned all about the mean stats, how you might die of a pig heart disease, why earthworms aren't always the best for the earth, how leprosy can help you regrow your liver. Why colonoscopies are totally useless. How herpes might be the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Why a lack of serotonin isn't the major cause of depression. How we figured out that Epstein Barr is what causes multiple sclerosis. How one science badass overturned 15 years of scientific fraud. And how fusion won the day. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 644. Oh my God. The fraudulent information on Alzheimer's research is coming from inside the lab. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>